Well, welcome uh, to this uh, this afternoon to this very interesting hybrid event. Special welcome to our audience here in North Great Georgia Street, and an even more special uh, welcome to those of you joining us online. The session entitled Opportunities to Improve Irish Healthcare is the inaugural event of the Ireland and the European Health Union series hosted by the IIEA and sponsored by Janssen Sciences Ireland. The format of, the, of today is a presentation by a keynote speaker from the European uh, Commission, followed by a discussion amongst our panelists here today. And we're very lucky to have Professor Mary Horgan, Mr. Tony O'Brien, Dr. Sheila Connolly and Professor Paul Brown. You're, you're all very welcome. After the panel discussion, you, the audience, can join in. For those of you who are watching online, you can use the Q&A function uh, on your screen. Please feel free to send the messages in during the, or the questions in during the course of the presentations, and we will come to them later. In putting a question, please identify yourself and any organization with which you are affiliated. Both the presentations and the Q&A are online. Feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA, and we are also live streaming today's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. So now to get to the good part. Um, it is a very great pleasure for me to introduce our keynote uh, speaker today, John F. Ryan, who is the director of the EU Commission's Public Health Directorate since September 2016, and Acting Deputy Director General for Health since December 2021. He is also currently the Commission Representative on the Board of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Over to you, John. Uh, just sorry, could, could I interrupt you? Uh, we're just having a problem here with the sound. John, I, you're muted. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Is that okay for you? Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. What I wanted to do during my presentation this afternoon is to give you a bird's eye view of what's going on in the health area at the European Commission level at the moment. And of course, maybe to dig down deeper in the question and answer session afterwards on any specific questions people might have. But I thought I would use my time to give you a general overview of what's going on and a little bit of the context as well. So without any further ado, I would say that um, um, the EU competence in health is an important point to understand. Uh, when we talk about EU competence, I'm thinking here mainly of the legal competence. And this is set out in the treaty. Uh, we, in order to have an activity in a particular area, the Commission uh, and the European Union more generally, of course, have to have a legal basis. And there is a, an article in the Treaty on Public Health, which says that health issues generally are an issue for, are issues for member states uh, under member states' responsibility and competence but that the European Union can encourage um, cooperation, sharing of good practice and uh, coordination of activities in this field. And we do that through a number of instruments, either legal or um, legal or financial, for example, incentive measures, which we can take. So very often people come to you and they say, well, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? It's very much an issue of what you can do and what you can't do under the, the legal basis which we have. So that was the first point I wanted to make. However, of course, uh, with any legal rule, there's always a whole series of exceptions. And the exceptions are sometimes more interesting than the actual rule. So uh, I wanted to explain to you that um, besides this general principle that the member states are responsible for the organization delivery of healthcare, you have this community competence for coordination, cooperation, sharing of best practice. And that's generally speaking, describes what we do in non-communicable diseases. So everything to do with cancer, the cancer plan, the mental health initiative, uh, all, of our, all of our other activities on public health are in this framework. It's a, it's a non-legal framework or a soft law framework. 
And as I speak uh, this afternoon, uh, the colleagues in Brussels are discussing a new recommendation, a council recommendation on cancer screening, which is perhaps an exa a good example of this soft law coordination mechanism that we have in the field of non-communicable diseases. Uh, speaking now on the uh, exceptions to the rule, there are a whole series of exceptions to the rule, and you see that these are, are, are quite um, topical. Uh, you have the area of pharmaceutical law, you have medical devices, you have blood, organs, tissues and cells, you have the tobacco legislation, you have cross-border healthcare, digital health and communicable diseases. These are a list of exceptions to the rule that the European Union does not legislate on health. And you might say, well, how is that compatible with what I said earlier on about the, uh, the article in the Treaty on Public Health, which says that all of this is for the member states? Well, the legislative examples which I gave you just now on pharmaceuticals, medical devices, blood, um, tobacco, cross-border health care, and uh, communicable diseases, digital health, all of these examples uh, arise from the internal market legal basis, where we have a very wide and strong uh, legal basis to uh, harmonize European uh, legislation. And in all of these areas, there are current activities going on, uh, which are legislative in nature, and which uh, involve either new or strengthening of existing legislation. And just to spend a few minutes on this, um, the uh, legislation on pharmaceuticals, for example, uh, dates for, from way back from a considerable period of time. And the European Commission uh, published a, a white paper on reforming our pharmaceutical legislation with the intention of, and this was in November last year, with the intention of ensuring access to affordable medicines addressing unmet medical needs, and also uh, improving the resilience of our health systems by having a, perform a high performing pharmaceutical industry. So these were some of the um, ideas that were set out in the pharmaceutical strategy of the European uh, Commission. It had over 50 different initiatives. The one I wanted to focus on today is the uh, pharmaceutical package, as we say, the legislation on pharmaceuticals, uh, which is in the process of being revised and reformed at the moment with the intention, as I said, of at the same time, improving access of patients to innovative medicines, uh, encouraging a, an innovative um, and high performing pharmaceutical industry and uh, tackling these inequalities which we have in Europe in access to new medicines, new therapies. So as part of our better regulation uh, philosophy in the Commission, there's a whole series of different stages of stakeholder consultation, uh, which involved member states, the industry, patient groups. This ended up in what we call an impact assessment, which is an analysis of the evidence that's out there for different policy options. We're in the process at the moment of finalizing that, that analysis, and we hope to make a legislative proposal on pharmaceutical products at the beginning of next year. This will cover pharmaceutical products in general, but it will also include uh, currently separate legislation on pediatric and orphan drugs. Orphan drugs are those medicines which obtain a specific regime, legislative regime, because they're intended for rare diseases, for example. And uh, the package will also include specific proposals regarding the issue of new antimicrobial uh, agents, because we know that there is no business case for a company to develop and produce new antimicrobials because the idea is that you don't sell those antimicrobials afterwards because if you do, then we're back to square one. So we're trying to figure out a mechanism where we would provide an incentive for um, the production of new antimicrobials, which is a global problem, uh, which we're confronted with in the framework of antimicrobial resistance. So that's one example where the European Union is actively 
revising and improving, I would say, or hoping to improve our legislation on pharmaceutical products, which is a product that everybody in this room, everybody who's watching me, consumes some sort of pharmaceutical product, if not daily, well, certainly on a regular basis. So it's really something which I think is of interest to everybody, and not only to the industry, not only to governments, but also to citizens. Second example would be the area of medical devices, where we have a bit of an issue at the moment because we have new legislation, again adopted under the internal market rules, which uh, enable the free circulation and approval of medical devices across Europe. And the problem there is that the deadlines for the introduction of this legislation are catching up with us. In other words, the legislation which is in the, which sets out the deadlines for implementation will be very difficult to respect. And we're coming to a cliff edge at the moment where uh, if we don't move the goalposts somehow in terms of the implementation deadlines, we'll find ourselves with products which will no longer be able to be put on the market. So this is an issue which is being discussed actively at the moment in order to avoid this cliff edge situation where products which are on the market uh, would have to be removed. But again, uh, an example perhaps of health legislation or health products legislation, which really um, affects more or less everybody because everybody consumes these sorts of products. Third example would be the blood organs, tissue and cells legislation. And if you remember the uh, scandal of tainted blood or contaminated blood many years ago, this actually led directly to the implementation of this European legislation. And this is being revised at the moment as we speak in the European Council and the European Parliament to put in place new, new arrangements for the uh, approval and transfer of blood organs, tissues and cells. Quite a very strong ethical aspect to all of this, of course, because the question of whether donation should be paid for the question of uh, the transfer of cells, for example, it's all quite complicated from an ethical point of view. Tobacco legislation, I probably don't have to say too much about this, but it's a good example perhaps of where, in fact, um, the internal market allowed us to bring in rules which assured a high level of health protection. And I must say, when I started in, in public health in the commission, this was my first uh, dossier and uh, developing the tobacco legislation. And uh, in fact, our justification at that time for introducing an internal market uh, directive on tobacco was because Ireland had introduced a national law, uh, which we wanted them to uh, consider from the internal market point of view. And the result was that we introduced the European directive because if the Irish, and some other member states had uh, introduced national legislation, this would have meant that the internal market would have been um, obstructed. And that was really the purpose of the directive was to ensure common rules for tobacco products across Europe, which is what we have now. We have very strong tobacco legislation on ingredients, on labeling, on advertising and so on. But it all stems back to this Irish law in the 70s, which really kicked off the whole discussion and gave us a legal basis, which we wouldn't have had otherwise. Further example might be on digital health, where we have um, legislation which is being proposed now on introducing e-health, on sharing of data, on introducing e-prescriptions, uh, e e-health you know, e tools uh, across Europe, which we hope will be of interest to patients, but also of use to researchers and to uh, people who are trying to develop new therapies that this data would become more easily available under the condition of confidentiality and anonymization, of course. Uh, and I would mention as well the legislation which has just been adopted on um, cross-border health threats, which sets in place a system for surveillance of communicable diseases like Zika, Ebola, uh, seasonal flu, hepatitis, HIV, all these diseases, about 52 diseases which are subject to EU surveillance. 
on the basis of a common case definition. And this data is reported to the uh, European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. And on that basis, we know whether TB is increasing, whether HIV is increasing, whether seasonal flu is increasing and so on. On top of this, we also have an alert system, which we use for immediate electronic alerts. So when there's a case of Ebola in a passenger traveling through Frankfurt Airport, for example, we can inform the 27 member states in real time of this particular passenger, his, his or her uh, personal data, and that contact tracing can then take place. So it's a very effective way of tracking uh, the spread of communicable diseases. Third uh, element of this uh, legislation is in relation to uh, risk assessments. So the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control advises the member states on the measures that need to be taken in a particular outbreak. So if, for example, if you have the case I gave you of an Ebola uh, passenger traveling through Frankfurt, the, uh, the risk assessment would advise on the measures that need to be taken to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to limit the spread of that outbreak. And uh, that legislation also covers joint procurement, which you've all benefited from in one way or the other, because uh, the European Union jointly procured masks, gloves, ventilators, therapies, and vaccines for COVID. And this is still ongoing as we speak. So this is a very operational um, legal provision which allows the Commission on behalf of the Member States to jointly purchase these medical countermeasures. I think the total amount of the investment we made jointly was about 8, 8 billion euros so far on these types of products. Now, um, these are some examples of the legislative uh, activities. Let me mention in a few words the non-legislative activities, and I'd mention here that this covers most of our public health um, activities. Most of our activities are in the area of non-communicable diseases, uh, which represents 80% of the disease burden in Europe. So I'm talking here about things like cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mental health, and so on. And in order to have a joined up approach, an integrated approach to prevention of these types of diseases, representing again 80% of the disease burden, um, they're very closely linked to each other. So if you're talking about uh, the determinants of health, one determinant of health, such as smoking, can very often affect lung cancer, but also cardiovascular health. And, and perhaps other conditions as well. So it's important that we have a joined up approach. And we adopted together with the World Health Organization, what we call Healthier Together. It's an initiative designed to support the member states and the stakeholder communities like the NGO groups, the patient groups, health professional groups, to take specific activities in relation to non-communicable diseases. Thinking here, for example, about an Italian project on cardiovascular screening, which was evaluated, shown to be effective, and was then proposed to the member states to be scaled up uh, to, I think, 14 or 15 member states who had an interest. And this was done using European finance. So we, we select the best practices, we evaluate them, and then we scale them up in relation to some of these uh, non-communicable disease challenges. In addition to this, we have specific flagship initiatives, and I'm thinking here of the Europe Beating Cancer Plan, which is running at the moment. It was adopted last year. And the Europe Beating Cancer Plan uh, consists of activities on prevention of cancer. So nutrition, um, uh, the tobacco activities I mentioned already, uh, but also other uh, initiatives to try and re reduce obesity, for example, which is also a determinant of cancer. So we have a number of these prevention activities. We also have early detection. I mentioned that the Council of Ministers is discussing today the new Council recommendation on cancer screening to extend cancer screening to prostate, lung cancer, and um, also to um, 
to uh, lung cancer to prostate cancer and uh, will be reinforcing the existing recommendations on breast cancer, colorectal cancer and cervical cancer. So that's an example of the type of activities we would be proposing under early detection of cancer, but we also are, will be levering the, um, the pharmaceutical package and the reform of the pharmaceutical legislation to try and improve the access uh, of, of new therapies for, for cancer uh, through the pharmaceutical legislation. And finally, issues like the right to be forgotten for cancer patients. More and more patients are surviving their cancers, but they have difficulties in accessing, for example, financial services. So we're working with Commissioner McGuinness in order to try and develop a code of practice which would um, encourage the uh, financial services industry to put in place the possibility for uh, survivors of cancer to access more easily uh, financial services. So this is one big initiative that's going on at the moment uh, in relation to cancer, but there is also a, a new initiative announced by President von der Leyen in the State of the Union speech, where she wants us to develop an initiative on mental health. And of course, we've seen an explosion of interest in mental health since COVID. I think people became much more aware of the issue. And the European Union, the Commission at the moment is trying to bring together the different strands of uh, initiatives we might take to support um, citizens, citizens mental health. So you can see here a number of initiatives on cancer, on non-communicable diseases. I should mention as well the topic of vaccination because vaccination is not only a COVID issue, it's much wider. And there is a lot of vaccine skepticism, which has not disappeared. I would say it's increased over the last few years. And therefore, the Commission is also trying to um, support the uh, public health uh, promotion of vaccination as a public health tool. And we're working very closely with our member states, with the Czech presidency at the moment, particularly also with health professionals, whether it's physicians, doctors, nurses, pediatricians to try and encourage them to engage and support uh, vaccination. Now, uh, say a few words about health in all policies or global, uh, you know, the introduction of health in other EU policies. That's quite an important part of what we do. I was online yesterday with the European Environment Agency on looking at the links between climate change and health. And of course, climate change is, is something that's happening very much in the background, sometimes in the foreground as well. But it has huge health implications, both for uh, vulnerable groups in our population, but also for our health systems, I would say. And this was something which was discussed yesterday in the context of the European Environment Agency report. We try, uh, through our context within the Commission, working with DG Klima, work with the Environment Agency to try and identify where mitigation and prevention measures might be taken by the member states' health systems. How can we equip the health systems in the member states with the tools to deal with these sudden events, which can be quite catastrophic? Uh, looking as well at uh, issues around environment and health, you know, we have a lot of legislation on the environment and health, how do you improve the quality of the air, for example, to avoid the problems that occur with poor air quality or poor water quality, um, noise pollution? All of these things are dealt with in European legislation, and it's our job to make sure that we try and include a strong health protection in all of these other pieces of legislation. Climate change and environment are examples. Third example is the reform of the common agricultural policy, where we're arguing, uh, not arguing, we're, we're discussing at the moment with our colleagues on how a high level of health protection could be included in the reform of the common agricultural policy. For example, through the promotion of healthy food in our schools, we have a schools food, food scheme. We have a prom agricultural promotion scheme. How do we ensure that we're not promoting biscuits and alcohol products, but that we're promoting healthy products? 
The issue of red meat, of course, is also an issue uh, linked to climate change as well, but it's linked as well to the agricultural policy. So you can see we're trying really to identify those levers within other policies, such as agriculture, environment, climate change. Taxation, of course, is another example where we're trying to make sure that the taxation rules don't um, undermine the alcohol control policies or the tobacco control policies, which um, the health departments are uh, trying to put in place. A few words on global health, where the Commission will be shortly publishing a white paper on global health at the end of November. The idea being to better link our international activities on, uh, on global health. We've seen how an international cooperation is important in the case of COVID, where you know it's very much an international outbreak. We're seeing the same thing at the moment with Ebola in Uganda. And uh, this is something which is not only limited to uh, communicable diseases, it goes much further. Uh, so we need to try and promote uh, global health in all of our policies. And I would say, fine, in my final words, I would say that we have a number of support mechanisms. We have our agencies which support us in all of this work. We have the European Environment Agency I mentioned already, the European Medicines Agency in Amsterdam, which analyzes and approves new vaccines, new medicines. We have the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control in Stockholm, which controls all of the collection of data and surveillance on communicable diseases. We have the, Lis the Bilbao Agency dealing with health and safety at work. And finally, I mentioned the Lisbon Agency on illegal drugs. So you can see we have quite a lot of scientific agencies which feed into our policy making work at European Union level, which of course support the member states directly. And, and perhaps in my last word would be about finance. I think COVID has had one benefit, which is that it has woken up um, the, uh, the, on the need for stronger investment in health. And we now have a quite a strong EU for Health program, which finances the type of activities I've just been talking about. We have the uh, uh, Horizon Europe program, which provides research funding for health, also very strong uh, budgetary resources available there. And probably most importantly of all, we have the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which is something specifically set up in the context of COVID, where over 40 billion, 40 billion euros have been spent already on health projects. This Recovery and Resilience Fund far exceeds the money that's available in the health program and in the research program. So it's not something you should forget about. And it does provide the actual financial tools for the member states to invest in antimicrobial resistance, stewardship, uh, providing for strengthening of hospitals, primary care, and so on and so forth. So I, I hope I've given you a quick helicopter view in uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes of what's happening at the European Union level. I'd be very happy to engage in the discussion as we go through the meeting. Thank you again. Thank you very much, John. That was really, it was very informative, but it was also very interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we'll now turn to our panelist, and our first panelist today is Professor Mary Horgan. Um, she is the current president of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland and the first woman in the road since 1654. I think that means ever. <laughs> but, uh, she is also the former dean of the School of Medicine in UCC and an infectious disease expert herself. You have the floor, Mary. Um, and thank you, and thank you for great talk. Um, as an infectious disease doctor, one of the areas that um, was spoken about was um, uh, the human health, animal health, the environment, they're all linked. And I think there is an onus on us as a country to really highlight the one health issue. I think we're really strong in agriculture. The thing that troubles us most um, as infectious disease infection community are two things, emerging infections, which are predominantly um, go from animals to humans, as happened with HIV, um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, Ebola, Zika, and secondly, antimicrobial resistance, which is really a global threat because 
We have very little development in new antimicrobials, and that was pointed out. So it's really welcome that the Commission is looking at ways of encouraging pharma to produce new classes of drugs and um, antibiotics. But as a country, and certainly at a university level, from a research point of view, I think, and, and intergovernment uh, collaboration, I really think we need to strengthen um, that One Health initiative. We do have vet schools, we have um, health uh, sciences in, in most of the universities here. Um, Tagusk is part of it, and there's really strong research there. But I do think we should be coming together as a country stronger in that area. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, Tony, we, we'll move on to you. Um, I think you, you are well known, a former head of the of the health service executive um, here in Ireland. Um, and also, I am told that you are an emergency first responder, um, amongst many other things. You're now a lecturer in health strategy at Trinity College Dublin. You're a chartered director, honorary member of the IMI. So, Tony. Well, hopefully there'll be no emergency response <laughs> in, in this room. I was listening to John's rundown of competency issues. It struck me, I guess I knew already, but it struck me that in every area where the EU has competency in the health space, it has been to the benefit of the citizens yes. of Europe and, and to the benefit of the citizens in Ireland. And that kind of leads me to the view that we need more of that competency. And we need that competency to be developed and utilized to its greatest extent. So for example, John spoke of the role of the European Medicines Agency very important entity. Uh, I think we need within Europe to see a streamlining of the way we provide market authorization, DG for patients, and also to look at the way in which citizens in different parts of Europe get differential access at different speeds to the benefits of innovation. Uh, and so while that obviously has to be a balance between that which member states control and that which the EU control, there is certainly scope for improving the quality of access to health innovation, whether that's in health tech, or new pharmaceutical innovation in a way that ensures that some countries are not significantly left behind. And of course, Ireland is one of those countries that, for a variety of reasons, its citizens tend to get left behind to wait longer for access to some of those new innovations. So, either by increasing the competency or by the EU looking at the differences that exist in different member states in the way that it has in some other areas, I think there would be significant benefits to health outcomes in Ireland and other countries. If the competency was extended into that space a little more. Thank you for that, Tony. Um, Sheila, uh, Sheila is uh, Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Sheila Connolly is a senior research officer in the social research division and joint research area coordinator for health and quality of life research in the ESRI. Her main area of research is in health system reform, with particular reference to healthcare financing and access. Could I ask you, maybe in your presentation, um, for your views on, on how you see these EU and as these initiatives at the EU level assisting Ireland in reforming our own healthcare system? Sure. So um, I suppose a, a lot of our work that we've done uh, over the last number of years, these sort of cross-country uh, comparisons, and um, I won't go into very much detail, I suppose, on the findings uh, from these studies. Um, but just, I suppose, some caveats um, from them. Uh, one around that when we're doing these sorts of things, the importance of looking at the definition and knowing what is being measured and is it being measured, you know, in a consistent manner uh, across the countries. And I suppose the other is that understanding the context for the particular countries and, and what is happening within that country. I think, you know, there's a lot to be learned from other countries of what is, you know, is done in other countries. Um, but I think we also need to be careful. So I think back in 2011, we had a new proposal for Ireland around uh, a system of universal health insurance, which is going to be based on the, the Dutch model. And the idea was that we would try and import that um, system and bring it into the Irish context. But I think it, it didn't happen for a number of reasons. But I think one of the reasons uh, that it didn't happen and one of the things that maybe wasn't caught out of uh, initially was that in order to have that sort of system, you need quite a significant population in order to have a number of insurers to have sufficient level of competition. And uh, I suppose from my kind of in the work that we've done, it's really to think about the context and not necessarily take off the shelf solutions from other countries and try to apply them in Ireland. And yes, there's a lot of things that we can learn, but it's often about digging a little deeper and see what we can take um, of what is applicable in the Irish context. 
Thank you for that, Sheila. And our final panelist, panelist is Professor Paul Brown, who is a consultant hematologist and director of the National Adult Stem Cell Transplant Program in St. James's Hospital, Dublin, and a professor of hematology at Trinity College, Dublin. What potential do you see in the European Health Union? Well, well thank you. And, and thank you, John. I mean, I think there were two things. I mean, my two areas, I suppose, of professional background that relate to this excellent discussion in the John summary. I was heavily involved, obviously, in both the blood and tissue directive implementation and its implications for delivering, you know, new cell treatments and other related treatments. And we've just come literally from a meeting to highlight the importance of European collaboration this morning involving many European colleagues here in Dublin between the National Blood Centre, the National Transplant Centre and the relevant competent authority individual representatives in this country and our European colleagues. And I would absolutely echo what's just been said around the panel in terms of the hugely positive contribution of these particular competencies that were specifically, as you said, exceptionally, John, mandated within what is otherwise, in some ways, and I'm learning this, a, co a cooperative framework. I suppose my second area, related area of professional interest over many years has been gaining access or the, by working in, in rare diseases, blood cancers in particular, but as a cancer specialist, and someone who's been heavily involved in many years in implementing new treatments for particularly blood cancers, um, is, is working, finding ways to and again, echoing what Tony in particular has just alluded to, the important gap that exists, uh, particularly in, and differentially across Europe, between an EMA approval, the relevant indication or marketing authorization being put in place, and our patients on an equitable basis, and I mean this across Europe, because of differential paying models. And historically, not in Ireland, actually, for most innovative treatments until, I would say, the last 10 years, uh, really new therapies were made available, so to speak, at the same time independent of one's capacity to pay. A disturbing trend that probably isn't fully appreciated in general now is that there are now examples I'm aware of where the capacity to pay or a particular insurance model may in Ireland give access differentially to new treatments, and this is simply not a tenable position. And I think there's an important gap. And one of the lessons you alluded to, John, that from COVID, and, and apart from the mandated and the competence legal functions, I mean, the enormous degree of cooperation in engaging with industry, whereas individual countries who simply wouldn't have had access uh, in a competitive way to an expensive new vaccine uh, that we all received, um, there was a European approach. And our cancer community, and I mean, we're part of this internationally, has been lobbying to find commonalities that are appropriate within the European frameworks. And I welcome, therefore, the further initiatives around the pharmacy package, I think John described it. Um, where there is a commonality in engagement. And we have to do this. The, the every single, I would just finish by saying, every single successful innovation, including the ones we discussed this morning, have arisen by partnership between health professionals, scientists, and our colleagues in industry. And there's no other model, but it requires support through the legislative model. And certainly in Ireland, we've seen the final thing I would say, just an example, we'll go into the technical details, but a particular cancer the Irish Cancer Registry, which is an enormously valuable resource in trying to see in the real world in Ireland how we're doing in a very simple way, how long are people living with different cancers. And the Irish Cancer Registry in Cork have just published an update, and it was very pleasing for us to see that at the top of the list of success was a particular blood cancer. And I could, we've done a detailed analysis in that particular case where uh, we can show clearly that access to community-based treatments about 10 to 12 years ago. So, and that's important, has now had a phenomenal improvement, over one third improvement of survival, which means many hundreds or several, probably several thousand patients in Ireland with that particular disease. But it took 10 years to see that impact on outcome. So I think if we go back to what Tony has alluded to and would have in his previous uh, role had to deal with in another angle, uh, if we allow, how would I say, access to these drugs to be driven by very well-intentioned, but particular communities that put particular cases rather than having a coherent European approach, we're going to have more and more challenges. So they'd be my observations at this point. Thank you very much. Now it's over to you, the audience um, here and online, uh, to send in their questions and to uh, identify who you are, are in the process. But I'm going to get, I'm going to take the prerogative of putting in two questions first to John. And the first one is, how do you see the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority interacting with states outside of the EU, but uh, close neighbours? For example, how do you see it interacting with the UK post-Brexit? That's the first question. And the second one is, and it, it, I think it relates to the questions that you raised there, Tony. Um, does the, health, uh, the 
health union paved the way to a single centralized route for authorizing medicines in the member states, where we still have this authorization at EU level and then again at national level. So thank you very much. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Yeah. Good, okay. Um, so on the first point on HERA, the Health Emergency Response Authority is uh, a mechanism that was put in place as part of the European Health Union package and is one of the direct lessons learned from COVID. And I described before the process we put in place for joint procurement of medical countermeasures. Um, this process was very much on the hoof. It was very much ad hoc um, because we had never before used, used this joint procurement mechanism in peacetime uh, or in a, in a situation of urgency. So it was a completely new uh, mechanism which had really to be made operational very, very quickly. And um, we carried out a whole series of procurement mechanisms on gloves and you know logistical support like uh, syringes, gloves, uh, gowns, ventilators, therapies, and then finally vaccines. It was considered by the commission that it would be good to have an agency in place that would uh, permanently take care of this type of uh, procurement. And if I might quickly describe the Health Emergency Response Authority, it's designed to identify upcoming threats. We were talking earlier on about the risk of zoonotic diseases. This is certainly one of the uh, areas where we think uh, a future threat would originate. So horizon scanning for these future threats is important. It would also include antimicrobial resistance because this is something that's there already. We know it's a problem. So this is within the framework of, of the Health Emergency Response Authority, identifying the threats, supporting research and development of medical countermeasures, whether it's um, antitoxins, vaccines, therapies, whatever it might be, uh, to try and encourage research in these uh, in development of these products. And thirdly, to encourage the uh, production and to actually arrange for the procurement of these products, which can be done, of course, in in advance by terms in terms of reserve reserve contracts and so on. You don't actually have to have the products on the shelf uh, in real time, but you can reserve the production capacity. So this is the idea of the Health Emergency Response Authority. It's largely based on the um, BARDA uh, mechanism, which is a similar mechanism in the United States. And I, I would say, finally, that on this issue, that security of supply is a real concern, because if you have pharmaceutical products or parts of pharmaceutical products, which the supply of which can be endangered in an emergency, and we saw this in, in COVID, uh, then you have a problem. You may have the products in existence, but you may not have access to the products. So ensuring security of supply is, is a real issue here. Now, uh, in terms of the uh, international um, aspects of, uh, of this operation, there have been contacts with the United States, uh, contacts going on at the moment with Japan and with other parts of the world, in particular with Africa, on uh, local production of vaccines. And we are engaged in international discussions on pandemic preparedness carried out at the moment through the G7, G20, through the WHO, through COVAX and all the other mechanisms that have been put in place. So HERA is very much involved in uh, the international aspects of pandemic preparedness and response as well. Uh, the context with the United Kingdom are dealt with in the framework of the withdrawal agreement and the framework agreement which we have with the UK. And therefore, there's no specific HERA component to that um, that relationship, I would say, but it's something which takes place in the framework of the general um, legal arrangements in place for uh, context between the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom. Thank you. And on the issue of um, the uh, a centralized route for authorizing medicines in the in the EU, do you see um, that uh, becoming a reality or will we continue to have authorization at the European level and then at the national level? 
Well, there's a terminology thing here because authorization exists at the moment at both the central level, uh, you know, the evaluation carried out by the European Medicines Agency, and then the product is approved by the Commission after that evaluation, and you have in parallel the national authorization process. What you're probably referring to is the um, the reimbursement arrangements, which are at the moment decided on a national level, and that will continue. Right. Um, I'm looking around the room to see are there any questions. Let me give you a question here that I've got from Sarah Henola, who's from the Finnish Embassy in Dublin. Uh, she says, thank you, John Ryan and all other speakers. What is Ireland's allocation of, uh, of funding uh, from the RRF into healthcare? Yeah, I replied to that question in the chat already, and I invited the colleague to write to me so that I can find the figures. But basically, I don't have the figures on the national basis. I have the European figures. And as I said, there are 40, 40 billion euros have been spent on health projects for uh, from the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which is really an enormous investment. Uh, and uh, on request, I'll find the, um, the figures for Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, then turning to our panel, can I ask you um, how you see the, the proposals at European level impacting on reforming the Irish healthcare sector? Where, where do you see the real benefits to us are and what sectors do you see the benefits? Mary, if, if you'd like to. Um, well, I think traditionally our relationship had been with the UK when it came to healthcare. We, we modeled a lot of what we did on that. I think we need to take that leap across um, and really strengthen our relationships with our colleagues in Europe. All, as, as Sheila said, our health services uh, differ, um, often nuanced depending on the population. But I do think that the relationships really do need to be strengthened. Um, heretofore, we didn't really have that. We're starting to do it um, certainly at a training level where we're um, exchanging trainees across who obviously, I, I'm, I'm talking about medicine, it may very well be done in other areas. Um, and for us to have a presence in Europe, I know there's a lot of engagement with ECDC, um, but I, despite, you know, we, we, we traditionally went to the English speaking um, countries when it came to training, but I do think that that strength, strengthening uh, is really important. And I certainly saw the benefit of it during the pandemic where we were able to exchange um, information policies really quickly with other scientific um, advisory groups. Um, so I think, move away from the tradition of, of English speaking health services and, and go into uh, mainland Europe. Tony, what, what would you, where would you see the opportunities? I agree fully with what, with what Mary said. Obviously, I think there are huge variations in the way healthcare is delivered across all of the jurisdictions of the EU. There's opportunity for learning from each other around strengths and weaknesses of each system, and every, and every system does have its strengths and weaknesses. But obviously, things like the cross-border directive, given the particular challenges we have in our health system in Ireland, are an important safety valve for patients who would otherwise have further delays in access to treatment. And I hope that we will see more of that in that irrespective of which country you live in, as a European citizen, I would hope that we will move towards an equity and equality of access towards the health care that we need. And that obviously exists in a whole series of domains I've already mentioned about the new medicine and John is right, reimbursement is the pointy end of that. That's not currently within the competency. I hope one day it will be. Uh, because uh, as long as you have twin speed or multiple speed processes around access to the healthcare you need, you do not have equality of access to the healthcare that you should have as a European citizen. I think it's an inevitable trend. I suspect it will take longer than any of us would want. Um, but I'm hopeful that the experience of working together in the COVID response has demonstrated once and for all that the European countries are much stronger when they act in concert, both in terms of purchasing power and planning and intelligence and so on, and that that will eventually translate into every part of the way we do that. Could, could I ask you, Sheila, in, in light of your research, you know, and comparative research, what do you see or is it possible to know from the data what are the barriers to a deeper cooperation in the health sector at the European level? Yeah, so 
I suppose I think that kind of echoing what uh, Mary and Tony have said is that we have very much looked towards uh, the UK as our model. And, you know, there are similarities between the systems in terms of the, you know, the very much uh, kind of tax taxed finance systems and the GP is the gatekeeper. But the way the Irish healthcare system has developed over the last 30 or 40 years, and I suppose in particular the importance of private health insurance, and the amount of people that are covered by private health insurance and the amount of care private within the private healthcare sector, it means that our system now is quite different from the UK. And I do think we need to start looking at you know, other systems which have a higher uh, percentage of private health insurance and a private market and to see what we can learn from them. You know, there's nothing to stop us making that learning and to looking. It's just, I, I think, changing a mindset a little bit to looking at Germany, to looking at France, to looking at um, the Netherlands, potentially those sort of countries, and just trying to you know, harness the learnings from those um, and see what we can actually learn in the Irish context or for the Irish. Paul, um... What do you see as the potential in this? Well, I, I think just building on, I mean, I think what's been very informative even with the discussion of, from, from John's presentation is, I think, an appreciation of, as you described it, the, for example, in the non-communicable disease, and again, the area I'm speaking to specifically in cancer, where whilst there isn't, how would I say, necessarily directives or specific competences, there are clearly um, through the, the EU um, support, if you will, which is very facilitatory. And while I think back to the earlier point, it's not simply about national reimbursement policies for particular medications, but if you frame this as a, uh, a community versus, let's say, in terms of how healthcare delivery is across Europe, it is a fact that um, some of the, many of the innovative treatments in effect, if you're going to link those, for example, to early detection and screening programs, uh, are the sorts of treatments that increasingly can be delivered not in hospital, but actually at not only in a clinic, but as we've learned through COVID, largely potentially at home. And I think there are definitely supports that, that, that just listening to what I've learned today um, <clears throat> through the EU supports, if you will, uh, even if the certain things are clearly national and certain things are not, where we can, I would say, drive forward so that it doesn't take as long as Tony and perhaps myself and the panel think to. Um, ensure a better distribution. And I think, for example, the use, we've heard specific anecdotes over the years in Ireland of uh, Irish people accessing, let's say, medical care or a program of care in another EU country. It's an incredibly valuable resource and it's been as well described in the public domain, obviously by Tommy Gorman, but it was no secret. I mean, he's written about it and, and published it. But, but I think that sort of has been historically underutilized and whether that needs to be a driver as COVID was for innovation. So I, I think this dialogue is incredibly useful and I would certainly put my hand up. There are many of us who are heavily involved in many ways, but probably don't fully appreciate uh, how the EU framework can help us. I learned it through the competency side under the tissue stem and I reiterate, we have used that in, in reality, it has meant a European standard, European interaction across all of the domains, including delivery of care within those areas that are governed by those directives. I fully appreciate that not everything is, is directive based, but the second piece that's been described by John, as I say, what you would call these initiatives, if I don't know what the correct term is, um, this is incredibly useful. And I think we have to be more active. And I would also reiterate historically until, and we had this discussion only yesterday, in terms of the real world access in Ireland, very often, if we were working with, let's say industry, Typically, for organizational reasons, it was UK Ireland in terms of who you would have to negotiate with. And I think people don't always appreciate that the reality is that, again, in bringing in innovative treatments and being able to present those for national reimbursement, there's a whole set of complex interactions behind the scenes. But in reality, very often, that would be head offices in UK somewhere. Clearly, and, and if you will, our colleagues in Amsterdam or Frankfurt or, or in Barcelona, it would be doing a different framework. So we have to completely change our methods of engagement as well and uh, on the ground. Maybe my just I suppose, real world observations. You're, you're saying we have to do this. Are we doing it? Well, I think I think we are. And I think Ireland has been very good at it. Um, and I think it's just extraordinarily good to hear what, what just what John and his colleagues are doing. As I said, I had a meeting this morning with another Irish. I mean, I think we've been very good, but possibly we, in the health field, I think we probably as Mary also said, um, Tony obviously um, held back a little and, you know, we always had the UK interaction. This is particularly in bringing forward certain initiatives. And I think we have to take a fresh look at that. Thank you. There's a question here from Grace O'Malley, a senior lecturer or CSI and clinical lead obesity service. 
And she asks, and I think this is a question for you, John. In terms of emergency response, are principles of access to rehabilitation services and healthcare also included, or is the focus solely on accessing pharmaceutical products, medical devices? Uh, she says she's thinking here about climate disaster, cyber attacks. Yeah, I actually already answered that as well in the in the chat as I was listening to you. Uh, we have a whole mechanism in place for um, emergency assistance of the member states, and it goes from earthquakes to forest fires to health events. And just to give the example of um, of the COVID outbreak, because it's the most recent one, uh, we have been using the um, the civil protection mechanism in order to evacuate uh, and move patients from one member state to another. I mean, at, at some stage, the French hospital system was overwhelmed by uh, cases of hospitalized patients with COVID, and we arranged for the transfer of these patients to other member states on a voluntary basis using EU funds and EU mechanisms. And I said it was the most recent example. The most recent example is actually the Ukraine war, where we're currently in this, in this situation where we're evacuating patients from the Ukraine medical system, whether they're civil patients or military uh, injured persons, to, again, to voluntary member states. So we, we've set up in place a med medevac um, uh, scheme to enable the transfer of these patients, which is extremely complicated, as you can imagine, because we can't actually access the Ukrainian territory the patients have to be moved from Ukraine to a neighboring country and then from there to a receiving member state. And uh, we use our mechanisms, for instance, to support the logistics of this transfer of patients, but also the, uh, the repatriation after treatment, after hopefully successful treatment, or uh, even the organization of prosthetics and that sort of thing, uh, the transfer of uh, essential medical products to Ukraine uh, for the hospital system in Ukraine, thinking here of um, uh, difficulties about access to HIV medicine, for instance, where you can imagine that the Ukraine population had access to Russian medicines in the past, and now we have to try and replace those with European authorized medicines. So it's extremely complicated, tricky business uh, carried out in wartime uh, with very, very short deadlines. But that's something that's become routine business, I would say. And we work very closely from the public health side with the emergency civil protection people in order to try and provide assistance in real time. I'd just like to go back maybe and speak a little bit about uh, the cross-border healthcare uh, file, because this again is an example of an internal market um, legislation, or a legislation which was introduced because of the internal market. What actually happened was there was a guy in Luxembourg where I live, which uh, this guy wanted to buy a pair of glasses more cheaply. And across the border in Trier in Germany, the glasses are about half the price. So he decided to go to Trier and buy his glasses there. And when he came back to Luxembourg with his glasses and he asked for reimbursement, the Luxembourgers said, no, you can't have reimbursement. You got to buy Luxembourg glasses. Now, there were a multiplication of these cases across Europe. And finally, the commission was encouraged by the court, the European court, to try and introduce legislation. And that's the basis for and the origin of the cross-border health care directive. And without going into all the details, just to give you, it, it does allow for a patient in one member state to seek treatment in another. And the reimbursement is actually on the basis of the reimbursement arrangements in the country of origin. But it also, as Professor Brown was saying, allows the creation of what we call European reference networks. And we have about 24 of these reference networks which are basically networks of hospitals in the member states on a voluntary basis, which we pay for. So in other words, you're not actually transferring the patient, you're transferring the expertise. So imagine that a patient comes in with a rare disease into a hospital in Poland. The doctor, the member of the network in Poland can then seek advice on the appropriate treatment 
for that rare disease from the other members of the network. So this is an operating mechanism which we use to avoid that patients are pushed around Europe in order to get a diagnosis or to get a proper treatment, but that the expertise can travel more easily in a virtual way between the members of the network. So this is a, a little bit the consequence of this guy who went to buy his glasses across the border. A whole system was put in place. And we talked earlier on about e-health. That's also a consequence because that's also part of the cross-border directive, the possibility of having e-health tools to be able to transfer your, your prescription from one country to another, or to be able to share medical imaging between member states, for example. But uh, I, I would really think as well that uh, it's important that you realize it's not only healthcare we're talking about here, it's also the importance of the European Union in terms of prevention of disease. I think it's really important. And the tobacco file is probably the best example I could give where European legislation has saved lives uh, in terms of reducing the danger of tobacco products and trying to remove them from normal business by prohibiting advertising. So I think prevention for me is really important as well because we know that a huge number of cancer cases, for example, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes can be prevented. So why don't we invest more in prevention and use our legislative tools to try and reduce the exposure of the population to these commercial determinants of health? Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Any questions here from the, from the audience? Please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mark Hanavan, um, Janssen Sciences Ireland. I, I just have a question around the European health data space. And I suppose we fare so well in many aspects of our Irish health service, but one area which you could never accuse us of doing well in is around health information infrastructure. And uh, I guess just in general, the, the use of data for many beneficial purposes within our health service. We heard recently from the HICWA um, published a really good report last week on what the potential positive implications, I guess, and the, and the push factors, I guess, coming from Europe on um, health information infrastructure and how that might really force us finally to develop, uh, you know, a, a cohesive electronic health record to put in place a framework around secondary use of data for, you know, better clinical research, better, you know, patient care. Um, better cost effectiveness studies and things like that within our health service. My question to the panelists and all of them, including uh, John, I think, is what, what are the risks for Ireland if we don't fully grasp the nettle and, and participate in electronic uh, in, the, in the EU health data space by developing our health information infrastructure and, and fully investing in it? And I guess what might be the benefits in your various areas of uh, you know, clinical health service expertise? Mary, would you like to kick yeah. off on that? I mean, what can I say? It should have happened years ago. It's absolutely essential that we use some unique patient identifier. We all have a PPSN number. Um, I'm not too sure, and Tony may have more insight into that, why we aren't using it. It's absolutely essential. Our country is changing demographically hugely, and we need to meet the me needs of our new Irish and the older population, all that. We can't do that without good data, but also not only longevity, but the quality of life that people have given all the spend that we have. And we have a huge spend in the country and the data, our ability to base things on data is really poor because uh, of that. I mean, Tony might have more insight into why we haven't been doing it up to now. We all actually do have a unique self-identifier. We have since 2016, but none of us actually know what it is. <laughs> because it hasn't been deployed apart from through the vaccine program, um, which has been a bit of an accelerant. Um, the, truth, the truth is, I think, um, that there has been a, gov a governmental hesitancy around two issues. One is the cost deployment, uh, the replacement of many existing manual systems with the enabled systems necessary for its deployment. And in, in, the, in the years I was in the health service, I think I had my first discussion around the necessary legislation in about 2008. It took a very long time for those discussions to get to anywhere because of real sensitivity around privacy issues and data protection now obviously addressed through the GDPR mechanism. But to answer your question, I think the real danger for us is that our, our electronic health records at the moment in many hospitals are a room full of lever files. That is a clear and present danger 
for the safety of patients and clients in our healthcare system. And until that is addressed and addressed effectively, that danger cannot be removed. But also, if the system continues to lag behind comparative systems, our appropriateness to take advantage of research opportunities, development opportunities, innovation opportunities, will will fall further behind. And that will also be to the detriment of our system and everyone. So it, it's a really important question you ask. I don't have the answer to when that's going to be resolved, unfortunately. But there are significant moves taking place, which lead me to have more optimism now than I would five years ago. Paul, could I ask you to, to address that? Yes, I, I you know, it, 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 it beggars belief. And I think it just by chance, the meeting I was at, there was presentations from uh, colleagues in the Netherlands through their blood service and in Denmark, both of which in many ways are countries that within the EU framework, we have often looked at for certain system analysis. And of course, they presented excellent and very relevant informational research, you know, uh, what you might call evidence-based analysis in the relevant domains, based on exactly what we're just discussing, completely electronic and uh, totally compliant with GDPR by definition, since they're both highly effective members of the EU and within the framework. Uh, it beggars belief. I was fortunate to work in a hospital during the cyber attack, which continues to have an EPR system. We have an electronic system, at least within the hospital I work in. And I have to say, I, I couldn't go back. I mean, and nor can anyone I know. But the problem is that all of our nursing staff, our pharmacists, and our junior and non, you know, temporary medical staff are rotating in and out of these hospitals. And I had a conversation on Wednesday with two of them. We said, I just can't do this. I have to go to Center X where I'm looking for charts. It just beggars belief. And not to have this reprioritized at a government and a parliament at a door level. I, 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 you know, I think we really will be deeply exposed as a country in terms of our credibility to engage in innovation and development without immediately and rapidly now addressing this. There's been millions of excuses. And we've all anybody, I'm no IT expert, but there are people I know in this room and others who have outstanding capacities in relation to implementation of technology. We, but we've, I did get a smartphone 10 years ago and I realized pretty quickly, it doesn't matter what the big system says, the people will find ways to communicate. And we learned that through COVID. So I really think, if you will, the, the regulatory and the government, the system is way lagging behind in this. It's, it's, it's a very urgent question and we keep putting it off to the next committee. So I feel quite strongly that we're going to deny our own population uh, decent healthcare within the European framework. So really welcome the EGD initiative as a push, as was said by, those who know more about this than I do. Before asking you, could I just um, ask you, is the problem uh, political space, political attention, or is the problem financial resources, or is the problem I, resistance? I, I can only give a personal opinion. I mean, my sense talking individually with people who would be in that domain are, are excellent and very well disposed and absolutely see it. And we've brought um, policymakers and opinion informers and politicians to see how EPRs work and to determine. I don't think there's any resistance per se. I don't quite understand that maybe, you know, I really don't. I mean, maybe there's people more attuned I, to- uh, I think maybe communication with our very educated population. We've seen how educated um, the Irish are to say why it's a good thing, why it's absolutely necessary, and that the drive should come from the public to demand this because of its, you know, it ends up that you get quality care, quality research, engagement with our colleagues in Europe. Um, so I think if the public knew the benefits of it, it would drive the issue. I mean, the one, how to say, politically informed piece, I would have, I mentioned earlier an analysis that we were able to do with our colleagues in the Irish National Cancer Registry Service, which uh, Tony would be very familiar with his previous domains, uh, is an outstanding resource. And this is the establishment of the Irish Cancer Registry so that it could actually have access to data was in fact debated extensively in Dáil Éireann and discussed and was underpinned by a piece of legislation, as you know, to allow access, if you will, to the files. And, and so it's actually an exceptional piece of, um, there was an exception made uh, for those who know more about this again than I do, but I do know this. And that has allowed us to be at least able to say, well, whatever, but, but when you come to match what they're allowed access through the re registry, and this is just in the cancer domain with the important uh, other pieces of clinical information, protecting the rights of individuals and their confidentiality, nevertheless, at the same time, you can't do it. And I know Mary would know about this as well. So, you know, I think these are frustrations that the relevant experts have represented. And I don't think there's an intrinsic resistance. Perhaps it hasn't been prioritized, but I would have seen it. It's as urgent an issue in terms of our strategic policy as a country as anything else. Thank you. 
There, there are some real islands of excellence around the use of data and the healthcare system, the registry. St. James has yeah. a need to guard primary care reimbursement. So there are real strong islands. What there is not is a total ecosystem. And part of the reason for that is historically, if you look at the percentage of our health spend that has been spent to be enable our health system, it's very small by international standards. And unfortunately, that came home to roost with the cyber attacks yeah. in terms of, you know, there were still Windows 2007 computers operating throughout the network. As terrible as the cyber attack has been, and as enormous as the cost of it has been, I think it's probably the trigger for a completely new approach. And I know that you know it's, it's a central feature of the, the Slodgett Air project. It's something that the current minister has been speaking about recently in terms of the investment that's needed to bring the health ICT estate up to spec. Um, but it's not going to be an instantaneous fix. It's a slow enough fix. But I think that there are many signs that we're heading in the right. Sheila, are we an outlier in Europe in this area? Yeah, we certainly are. And I think um, in, in the health services research space with every report that the SRI you know, uh, produces, the conclusion is always we need more and better data. Um, we try and publish in international journals and everybody looks at us and goes, well, why don't you have this data? You know, it's a, it's a major issue. I think you know, it's, there's improvement over time in the hospital setting and you know, the high data again from the research perspective is really useful. On the community-based side, very, very poor data. Um, talking to people working within this space, I don't think they, you know, they're doing what they've always done and maybe they just haven't had a headspace to stop and think, well, you know, how can we get data that is useful for by other people and that we can kind of aggregate it at a community level or at a, a national level. So maybe even getting that space for those individuals to come in and to do that would be uh, really useful. Mm -hmm. Could I could I ask John, how can the, the EU and the EU Health Union proposals assist Ireland in this area? Well, I think uh, we've had many, many years of projects dealing with e-health and developing tools. As long as I've been around, we've had European networks and European projects. And I must say there are some member states who are far in advance of Ireland. Uh, I mean, I've, I've witnessed this myself. Some countries have jumped on the bandwagon years and years ago. They took advantage of investment funds. They set in place the legislation. Uh, I have not been aware that the same thing has happened in Ireland in my home country. You know, when I go to a doctor here in Luxembourg, uh, the doctor uh, is in a paperless office. There is literally no paper in the office. Everything is on screen because we have an electronic health record. The doctor can see when I was last at the dentist. They can see when I last had a colonoscopy. They can see uh, virtually everything. So I think there are huge advantages for the patient. And that's really where I'd like to start. There, you know, we've got to sell the case for digitalization of the health systems as a patient safety issue, I think, because we have clearly shown uh, through the introduction of electronic health records in some of our member states with the most serious antimicrobial resistance problems, we have shown that the introduction of electronic health records can actually track where the problems are occurring with stewardship of antimicrobials. And it's, it's an electronic tool which allows you to dig down and see where the prescriptions are taking place, where the use of antibiotics in a, in a, in a, in a wrong way is, is happening in the hospital system and where the resulting infections, uh, drug-resistant infections are occurring. So there are really practical examples. Also, in terms of adverse reactions and so on, the, the fact that you're able to link these in real time with the patient and with the uh, medicine systems uh, is also an advantage for the patient. I would say Europe has one of the strongest regimes for personal data protection in the world. We're always being attacked by third countries such as the United States saying that our rules don't allow this, our rules don't allow that. But I think the patient should be reassured that the intention is never to remove patient confidentiality. The intention is really to improve patient safety and to make uh, to make uh, data available outside the silo of the individual healthcare provider, to make that data available to research so that innovative products can be developed more easily in Europe. And secondly, uh, it's also an advantage, a big advantage for the health professional who doesn't have to search around for the results of screenings, for the results of the history of the patient is all there in black and white. And it's done in a holistic, integrated way. So the Commission has proposed 
legislation on European health data space, which pursues this objective of making data, putting data at the service of patient safety and improved care. Uh, secondly, uh, helping the health systems to manage uh, this, this data and manage their patients more effectively, uh, particularly as they go between different parts of the health system. And thirdly, then encouraging uh, access to data through um, true uh, sharing of data, uh, true sharing of patient data with uh, researchers. And, and uh, we've heard mention here of registries. The European Union has been supporting registries for years in the area of rare diseases, cancer, um, but also in other disease areas. And I would say it's really important that we try and have um, a much more uh, integrated approach. And, and that's why this legislation will open the door to an improved um, data sharing system in the European Union, fully respecting patient confidentiality, together with the investments which we have put aside for the introduction of these systems at national level. Thank you, John. Um, there's two questions here, the back row and then the lady in front of you. Thank you. Uh, Bernard Milley, um, I work for IFA, I represent the research-based pharmaceutical industry in Ireland. Um, I have two questions mainly directed for, uh, for John. Um, the first is that Europe's um, you know, ability to attract investments, or indeed in particular, um, is declining against competition from Asia uh, and from the US. In fact, in the past 20 years, um, the global share of R&D activity in Europe has contracted by about 20%. Um, and so it's quite a, quite a big drop. So I guess the question is, uh, will the EU pharmaceutical strategy arrest that slide? Um, can we be confident that we will be in position to get more uh, R&D activity in Ireland? Uh, and the follow-on from that then, of course, is the manufacturing production um, uh, investments on the back of that innovation as well here in Ireland, where we have a massive footprint. Uh, and the second question is around, um, again, the strategy, which seems to confuse, I think, by P rights and access. Uh, suggesting that maybe access um, is related to IP uh, and that IP is a driver for medicines pricing, which we believe uh, is not the case. Um, and does John believe that those two things are conflated? Um, and what might be the plan to ensure that IP is protected in uh, the months ahead, uh, particularly as policymakers weigh changes in the legislation? John, would you like to take that? Well, yes, the answer is yes and no. I, I can't give too much detail on what will be in the pharmaceutical package because it's still being developed and decided. So I can't really speak in detail on, you know, the approach to IP rights and access and things like that. But I would say that the issue of um, improving the access of European population to, uh, and citizens to innovative medicines is at the core of the pharmaceutical revision of the pharmaceutical legislation. And we are trying to come up with mechanisms which link the authorization uh, of new medicines uh, at the European Union level with, and the protection which is granted under the pharmaceutical legislation to particular products uh, with the topic of, uh, of access uh, of the European population in the different member states to those uh, medicines. So it's a question of, um, it, it's, it's a difficult question because some of the, the levers or some of the drivers are covered by the legislation, some of the drivers are outside the legislation. We talked earlier on about the authorization mechanism where the products are analyzed and evaluated by the European Medicines Agency and then the authorization to put on the market is granted by the European Commission. Uh, for putting those products on the European market. But there is the phase afterwards or in parallel concerning the health technology assessment. In other words, the value added of those products is evaluated by the member states. And there is a separate directive on this, which is the health technology assessment directive. And then you have the decision on reimbursement. So it's not, a it's not an easy subject really to analyze. And what we are talking about today is the reform of the pharmaceutical legislation. We will be using that reform to try and improve as much as we can the, in, the possibility for uh, innovative products to be developed and manufactured and authorized and used in Europe 
so that will be one of the concerns of the uh, legislation. And at the same time, of course, we will be looking at uh, reinforcing the possibilities for European companies to develop uh, new products that's being done through our research program, principally. Uh, and there's a third issue, which is the issue of security of supply. And that's being discussed at the moment with Commissioner Breton. There has been a commission working paper published a few weeks ago on security of supply of pharmaceuticals, something we really became aware of, as I said, during the, pharma, during the COVID outbreak. So it's not a very simple question to try and answer, but I would say the pharmaceutical legislation does look at this topic of access to innovative treatments and um, the encouragement of uh, production and innovation in Europe. Thank you, John. I, I think we're beginning to run out of time, so I hope we can have time for two more questions. I think this lady here has a question. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Deirdre Murray, I'm a public health physician. I'm director of the Cancer Registry, so thanks very much to Sorry. Professor <laughs> I didn't you, you pay it. Those and things. I didn't even know my question. <laughs> Um, but and obviously I echo what people have said previously on the on the, the health information system. I suppose my, my question really is for John on inequalities or inequities, you know, um, either the e-health initiative or other initiatives is, uh, you know, where, where is European, where's European focus on those? I know in the cancer space, there's obviously a big development in the cancer inequalities registry. But I suppose, as Professor Horgan has said, we have a lot of new Irish which are currently with the Irish systems, we have no way of individually identifying ethnicity. And um, there are ethological, ecological other methods, but it would be helpful if there was a, you know, a, a standard method for all health services, you know, coming out of EU, that would be very helpful, I think, for people in my position. Thank you. John. Yes, yeah, so the, I would say there were many, many years of work on health inequalities at European Union level. And I remember in particular that the Welsh your neighbours in, in Wales were very strong on the issue of health inequalities when the UK was still a member state. Uh, we thought on the Commission side that this was a bit of a theoretical, philosophical discussion on, uh, you know, health inequalities are so unfair, let's do something about it. But actually nothing concrete uh, came out of that process, I would say, except good intentions. Uh, and therefore having ministerial declarations and calls to action and lists of recommendations are not very practical, which is why in the European Cancer Plan, we proposed and we implemented a quite an innovative approach, which is the measurement of indicators of inequalities between the member states in respect of, um, in respect of different aspects of the cancer plan. And this covers, for example, the access to early detection because you have some member states where the, the rate of take up or availability and take up of breast cancer screening is over 95%. And you have other member states where the uh, access to the access and take up availability of breast cancer screening services is less than 5%. So you might say, well, they're the same breasts, they're just in different member states. So why do you have a situation where in some countries it's over 95% and in some other countries it's less than 5%? This is not, from an ethical point of view, it's not acceptable. So we really wanted to try and identify these and map these um, inequalities, not for the purpose of pointing fingers, because the country's concerned, they know that there's a problem, but the idea was to try and then target the investments in those particular countries where the inequalities are greatest. Uh, I, I participated yesterday in a meeting on, on access to PrEP for HIV, uh, and the differences are enormous. In some member states, you have to pay 60, 70 euros a month to have access to PrEP. In other countries, they hand it out free. So, I mean, this creates all sorts of inequalities as well for very often uh, reasons which are difficult to understand. Uh, so I think it's really important that we move away from a philosophical discussion into a real, a real life discussion on where the differences are and how can we target the countries with the worst performing indicators and target support to those countries. 
either in terms of offering training schemes for health professionals, which is one of the things we do, or uh, targeting support through the Recovery and Resilience Fund for hospital reinforcement in those countries, or offering uh, support schemes for screening campaigns or for you know, putting in place guidelines and then implementing those guidelines. So I'm talking here really about not increasing the inequalities through European action, but reducing the inequalities through European action. Because the, the very fact that we have 10 or 15 years difference in life expectancy, even within the same city in some European countries is really incredible. It shows the link between uh, health outcomes and economic and social factors. There was a study published uh, this week by INSERM, which is the French Research Institute, if I remember correctly, uh, which showed that immigrants, immigrants into France had seven times more likelihood of having hospitalization for COVID than the native population. And this is really why it's important that you're able to measure these things and that regardless of the ethical considerations of uh, which we're familiar with about uh, race and so on and trying to, you know, or nationality and trying to um, gauge people's uh, origins, that nevertheless you're able to target your activities on the most vulnerable populations. And clearly migrants are one of the most vulnerable populations. So you've got to find some way of having a health information system that can identify these areas of problems and deal with them. One very final question over here in the corner, and we've about one minute left. Okay. That's, right, that's fine. Get the last uh, word. Hi, I'm Vicky McGrath. I'm the Chief Executive of Rare Diseases Ireland. And um, what we see happening here now with the introduction of the European Reference Networks is just going to be transformative for rare disease care in Ireland. Um, we're, I guess, in a situation right now where about 37% of the rare disease community doesn't have access to a specialist in this country. And, you know, that's what the ERNs are designed to do. But I guess what I'm concerned about is when that recommendation, when we're really up and running with the ERNs, and that recommendation comes out to give them this particular treatment, and that treatment is not available in this country, how are we going to, you know, handle that, I guess, inequality? Um, how is the reference network system actually going to be able to, to, to manage that? And I, I think Europe really, really needs to do an awful lot more for the small countries in that regard. When we look at a situation where we have a drug committee that meets for two hours a month, and you have other you know, situations in other countries where, where they're meeting for 20, 30, 40 hours a month, we just don't literally have enough bums on seats in the country to do everything that we need to do to keep up with the more populous countries. And how can Europe get us over that and get us through that? Any views? I think it goes, goes back to a discussion we've had before about the gap between an EMA market authorization and the accessibility in real time, in, in real life, as it were, to that, that medicine. And I think there is there is the scope, or I hope there can be the scope for the European Union at Commission level to at least examine the reasons for these variations and to bring forward recommendations for standardized approaches because there are tremendous variations. They come from different places. Uh, Ireland experiences with some manufacturers, they might get an EMA authorization, but they don't even apply for reimbursement because that particular company is dominated by a headquarters in the UK and Ireland doesn't seem very important on the one hand. And at the other end of the, of the spectrum, the lag time for approval in Ireland is clearly much longer than in many other states or many, many drugs. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've turned into an outlier. Mm -hmm. I, I would hope that if the European competency can be used to achieve it, we can be assisted to recognize and improve our position for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. I think we've come to an end. Can I thank all of our panelists? And good day to you all, and I look forward to the next in this series. Thank you. Thank you.